Welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today we are going to be rejoining Livia Llewellyn for part two of our interview. If you missed part one, then head back just one episode. We speak to Livia about furnace, childhood dreams, managing distraction, and a lot, lot more. Before we get into part two, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news! Now you can have a St- Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day! The 11 stories in Todd Keising's Ugly Little Things explore the depths of human suffering and ugliness, charting a course to the dark, horrific heart of the human condition. John Langan says, Todd Keising is a born storyteller, drawing the reader into artfully constructive narratives that scout the darker end of the literary spectrum with skill and bravado. Brian Kirk says, in Ugly Little Things, Todd Keising ventures deep into the dark abyss of cosmic horror. What he finds there, or what's found him, will terrify you. This is going to hurt, and you're going to like it. That's Todd Keising's Ugly Little Things, out September 15th from Crystal Lake Publishing, Tales from the Darkest Depths. And with that said, it is time for part two of The Conversation with Livia Llewellyn. And now for a horror interview. We've got another question from Patreon, and this is from Box Winnow who would like to know, if you ran a course on the art of story, what are some novels or short stories you would have the class dissect as masterclasses in the subject of this is how you do it? Oh, wow. Um, I, oh my God. (laughs) This is one of those questions I might have to answer like separately, like on Twitter or something. Um, well, I mean, if you, if, if, I, I was going to say, if you want, I mean, we can put that on hold and either you could email me an answer or if you have the means, just record. Oh yeah, I could do that. And you could, you could post it on your Patreon. That would be, that would be great because I actually, I, there are some very specific novels and short pieces of fiction. Um, uh, just off the top of my head, for example, um, uh, Laird Barron has written so much phenomenal stuff that it's it's kind of hard to to pick uh, one thing or the other. Uh, it's also amazing, um, but uh, his novella, The Forest, is probably the one that I go back to over and over again. I go back to it when I am stuck and can't figure, feel like I. I need to remember how to write again. Um, uh, it's one of those novellas where, or just pieces of fiction in general, where I feel like there's so many lessons to be learned in in how he's written it, um, and there's so many there's so many ways to interpret it. Um, wow. Um, actually, I really I would probably pick something by Jack Kerouac because his command of language is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and it seemed, it seems like it was easy for him and yet unbelievably hard at the same time. It's that kind of language where you're reading it and it, and it feels like it just kind of rolled from his head through his pen or, or through his, the typewriter ink, you know, right onto the page. Um, but it's so complex and there's so much packed into each sentence um, and there's so much lush description and yet there's there's um, very clearly a narrative and um, yeah I would definitely definitely something of of his I don't know what um, and then certainly something by Caitlin R. Kiernan and let's see who else. Emil Zola, I probably would pick something by him. Um, I would probably pick a play. Uh, maybe 
I don't think Shakespeare, but maybe, no, definitely one of the Greek tragedies. Uh, but uh, I would be very specific as to which translation. And I would spend a lot of time talking about why the translation the, and the translator's vision was so important. Um, yeah, that's just that's just like the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> but yeah, I could definitely come up with like a fake syllabus, you know, and send it to you. I would love to do that. That would be great. Yeah, that would be fantastic. So if you just email me that as and when you can, and I'll post that for our patrons. Yeah. And I mean, you, that would be really cool. Yeah, you suggested to post it to the patrons. <laughs> that that is an unintentional bit of great marketing for a Patreon account. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, and the only way people can see it is if they subscribe to your patron. <laughs> there you That's go. Right. www.patreon.com forward slash. This is horror. Just one dollar for the entire <laughs> syllabus. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because you bring up those those writers and, and when I'm reading your stories there's two two names that come to mind and, and Tanith Lee and Robert Aikman oh who was the second one Robert Aikman oh Aikman oh yes yeah. I'm sorry I didn't quite hear it. oh yeah yeah and it, it's like it, it's you know I, I feel like you, you probably you, you you're familiar with it, but it's not like it, it's informing your influence. It's like it's it's there. It's, it reminds me of that. It's it's it, it transcends it a little bit. It's like oh man, this is like really really cool. Actually, it's interesting because I read a lot of his stuff when I was much young younger. Mm -hmm. Um, like when I was in my uh, like nine ten through early teens, and also, um, uh. Uh, let's see, uh, John Belair's and Roald uh, Dahl. Um, mm -hmm. a, a lot of I read a lot of dark fiction, like dark children's books, um, and uh, a, a spectacular book called The Egypt Game, and that was one that really influenced me a lot. Um, and I, I would probably for my syllabus, I would pick, I would definitely pick one or two of those writers as well, just as kind of as if you get time, you know, re read these people. Right. Yeah. Very cool. Do you say that book's called The Egypt Game? Yeah, by uh, Zilpha Keatley Snyder, The Egypt Game. Hmm. I'm gonna have to check that it's out. It's about a group of kids who are fascinated by Egyptian history. And they kind of use it and they use their role playing as a way to solve a mystery in their neighborhood. Um, and that certainly informed my huge, you know, costume pageants. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so, yeah. <laughs> oh, and all of the Alfred, the, the, the early Alfred Hitchcock and the Three Investigators, that series. Oh, yes, The Green Ghost. I was, Ooh. yeah, I was not a Nancy Drew fan. I was not. I loved Alfred Hitchcock and the Three Investigators. I wanted to be those kids so badly. The one, the one I'm familiar with is the Green Ghost. Uh, but yeah, I grew up on the Hardy Boys. Not so much Nancy Drew, but it was like a, you know, I went from that stage, and then from Hardy Boys, I went you know directly into you know the Warren comics. You know the Eeries, the Creepies, the Vampirellas. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then uh, Man Thing, you know, Marvel. And I went through, I went through a stage that I might wish I still had those comics. And then, uh, and then, of course, you know, I got bored and, you know, discovered, you know, sports and things like that. And it was, you know, a while later. And then I got Stephen King. I was like, oh, wow, I'm coming right back to the stuff that I like. <laughs> Yeah, I went. I went from from the kids' scary books and and the three investigators to um, the nonfiction books, like about you know who's the real Dracula and did aliens really build the pyramids, all that kind oh, of yeah. in search of stuff, and the really scary shit, like and the like the time life books that have like all the murders all over the pages, and my parents would be like, oh my god, what are you reading? Um, 
and and anything like that having to do with like cryptozoology and you know Loch Ness monster and have our you know great people really visiting Earth, all of that stuff. And then from there, I went into Stephen King. <laughs> yeah, I remember reading probably way way before I needed to be reading it. Uh, uh, Colin Wilson's The Occult. You know, this massive book that I found at the uh, library and was, you know, I'd check it out over and over again because no one else wanted to read it. I was like, shoot, I'll read it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, can I check this out again? <laughs> and it was just like, you know, and I actually had a copy of it that I ended up buying. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's gone. I need another copy. And But it, it, you just, you can learn so much from that nonfiction stuff. It's unbelievable. And, and I love nonfiction because I, when I grew up of course I had all of my mother's history books so you know um, I mean there was so much weird shit in them that you know it seemed just a natural segue into the even more weird stuff I you know I was right. going from reading about you know gods and you know you know all of the mythology and then all of these incredible ruined cities and lost civilizations and um Oh, I also read, read um, Will and Ariel Durant's History of Civilization. I read most of it. Um, but I mainly what I read over and over again were the Roman years because that was some weird shit. And, yeah, I love those books. <laughs> so, I mean, we've mentioned a few times the novel that you're working on, but I haven't actually asked you specifically about it. So I know from previous interviews that it's a literary erotic horror but what can you tell us about the novel well it's it, it's I, I started out wanting it to be erotica but it, it is it very quickly was like no it's this is not going to be erotica um it's it's longer than erotica an erotic novel would be and um i I don't want to say this without slamming the genre. I couldn't. I couldn't write it in a way that would make it like, uh, you know, a Fifty Shades of Grey but good kind of thing. Um, I, I just. I. I couldn't do it. It very quickly became something else. Um, it's. It's horror, uh, and I wouldn't call it literary. Um, I would call it upmarket, uh, which is a term for genre that isn't usually sold to genre imprints, but maybe sold to more literary imprints at the, the larger publishers. Um, so there's some, it's, I would say it's, yeah, it's um, literary horror with, with a, you know, some uh, incredible sex scenes. I don't mean incredible as in great, but like, <laughs> <laughs> some very explicit sex scenes. That's mm. the word, yeah. Um, and well, having actually... read Engines of Desire, I can't possibly imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <laughs> if you read if you read the last story in Furnace, <laughs> right, right, that's yeah. Um, so what it is was I I took the uh, novelette on Follows, which is about the family that goes on vacation, and they're all actually involved in various incestuous relationships with each other. And I'm turning that into a novel. It's, um, uh, I've kind of expanded the world building a little bit. Um, it's, you know, the family is, is part of a, a, I wouldn't say clan or a cult, but I would say a clan of, of people who are incestuous and engage in various specific types of incestuous relationships in order to control their bloodlines um, and, um, in which, and, and the, the, the incest is between brothers and sisters who then get married and they have their own children and they, they have specifically, they have a boy and a girl who are then expected to become lovers and then married and then have their own children. Um, and then the, the family lines are culled and merged and, you know, in order to, you know, create in order to keep in, in order to ensure that there's not too much degradation um, of the gene pool although that is not successful in my book because it's horror um, and it's it's still from the point of view of the daughter the young girl 
who's in an incestuous relationship with her brother, whom she does love, but who is also in an incestuous relationship with her father, which is kind of against the clan rules. Um, but her father doesn't give a shit. And um, she kind of wavers back and forth between she doesn't care either, but she does. And she kind of wants a normal life, but she doesn't know what that is. And, um, and then some supernatural events start occurring and which, which may be originated by her. And I think that's about all I can say. Um, they, they do go on a vacation, like in the short story, the short version. Um, and the ending is somewhat similar, but it, it's a more fleshed out version of the story. A lot more things happen. You find out a little bit more about the clan and about the world itself. I had to make some adjustments. I realized this couldn't just be a normal everyday world. It's, it's a bit more um, pre-apocalyptic in nature, which, which is kind of like a thing right now in, in fiction. There's a lot of books that have come out that are kind of pre or post-apocalyptic slightly dystopian but they're not YA they're they're literary fiction so so I kind of I kind of added that aspect to it so so that's what it's about and there's sex lots of weird, yeah. weird sex shade I'm ready I'm a credit card ready I'm going to go ahead and awesome <laughs> it sounds like something right up my alley <laughs> Yeah, it really, really does sale. sound fascinating. And I mean, how did you change your approach when it came to writing longer fiction as opposed to the short stories? I guess what are the commonalities and what are some of the differences in terms of the writing and the planning? Well, it's it's interesting because the the story is very concentrated. There's a huge amount of information in about... Um, I think about 10,000 words and I, I thought, you know, I can write maybe a really short, like 60, even 50,000 word novel that has that same kind of feel, you know, really intense and, uh, um, but it's very hard to sustain that. And, um, I found myself kind of stretching out the information and, uh, I, at first I was going to write with kind of by, I, I was going to take apart the story and I was just going to like add to it. Um, and then I realized I couldn't do it, that I was writing a, a very, uh, a completely different style. And that also because the style had changed and because the story itself was bigger and there was more to it, that the protagonist herself had changed. She was not quite the same person as the person in the short fiction. And her relationship with her father is a bit different. Uh, all of their relationships are different. Um, and the world itself is different. Um, and and so I kind of struggled with that a, a while, trying to make it be like the story. And I had to abandon that and say, this is not the story at all. It's, I really have to just set that aside. I, I am I am sort of in quotes rewriting the story, but but I'm really, I'm using that as a springboard for a, a, a bigger story um, in which the language is much different and um, the events are similar, but, but yeah, the language, the, the grammar, um, yeah, everything has a very different feel to it. Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself going back over other stories thinking that this can be expanded? Because I know a lot, a lot of writers do that. I do it. I do it to all, like, I mean, especially my older stuff. I'm like, I could have turned this into, like, a, no, a novella, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, do you do you, do you do that as well? I mean, obviously you do, but, I mean, it's just something you always think about. I, I do, actually, a lot. Um, and the difference between doing actually doing it with Unfollows and the others is that I found that at some point I decided, you know something, no, this, this one is finished, it's done, I may do something else in another, like, uh, for example, Her Deepness. Um, I love the novella, I love the world that I created, 
um, I thought about expanding it, and then I realized, no, if I'm going to write more, I'm just going to write another novel in the same universe, maybe with the same characters or maybe with different characters who kind of knew the characters from the first piece. Um, there are some... There, there's one... There's really only one other story right now that I've written that I would love to turn into something longer, and that's the 400,000, which was the kind of YA uh, dystopian science fiction uh, uh, novel that I wrote um, about a girl whose eggs are harvested to make these monster hybrid uh I don't want to say dog soldiers because I know that another novel has just come out that that's like almost exactly that plot point, but kind of like hybrid wolf alien soldiers who are fighting this war, which may or may not be taking place. And I thought, it, you know, I've always thought it would be a really good novel, YA, um, but it's no longer as high, as high on my list for, for kind of working with as, um, let's see. Oh yeah, actually the last clean, bright summer is another one that I think I, I would maybe like to turn into a longer piece uh, about, um, a young girl who, uh, goes with her parents to, uh, the seaside town in Washington state where they reenact this kind of what is supposed to be like a family, you know, um, a traditional festival. And it turned out to be some absolutely horrifying fertility, right? Um, yeah, that one has a lot of like really disgusting stuff in it. So that I could really expand. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then there's there's also a, a number of short stories I've written. Um, when I did have a, a, a Patreon account, um, I was writing kind of like a collection of stories called Tales of the Black Century. Um, and it, the reason I was doing it was to kind of like force myself to write a, a story in a weekend, a, a kind of a way to like like change the way I approach writing, just just to do something different. And it worked for a while until it didn't. And I would like to go back and really expand on a lot of those stories and, and finish up the collection. Um, but yeah, most of my stories, you know, every now and then I read them through them and I'm like, no, this is, this is it. This is, you know, this is set. I'm not, I'm not going to redo it. Right. I, I, and I understand exactly where you're coming from, but uh, you know, it's, I find it fascinating, uh, you know, like there's there's different versions of, of things. You know, you got mm -hmm. like Peter Strop, you know, you have the Skylark, and then you have, you know, a, a Dark Matter. And it's like, it's oh, the yeah, same yeah. thing. And it's like, you know, and it's like, man, wait a second. I thought that Skylark was like, a, you know, like a story, you know, and then you find out, you know, it's actually like, you know, the same length. And you're like... Ah oh, man, and then you try to find the prices, and it's a hundred thousand freaking dollars. <laughs> you know, not that much, but you know, I mean, and you're like going, "Shit, man, yeah, no. really? How did I miss this?" You know. I actually, I actually don't. I've only done one thing that could be considered a collectible, and I, I did it for Brian Keene, um, because he's a great guy, and he's always been an incredible champion of my work, um amazingly generous guy and he invited me to be a part of his maelstrom imprint you know every year he does a, a collection of books that become collector's items right. and he always features one author other than himself someone you know up and coming new someone that his fans may not know uh, a lot about you know as a way of saying you know helping them along and saying here you know guys this guy's great or this woman's great you know go buy their work and so when I was involved, uh, he, uh, he edited an anthology of, um, of four novellas and, uh, the, I contributed one and, um, uh, the others were Cheshire Burke and Amber Fallon. Ugh, I forget the fourth woman. I feel so terrible. 
I will very quickly look it up as I'm talking to you. <laughs> um, and it's, it's called The Daughters of Inanna. And of course, it broke some of his fans' brains um, that he was featuring women. And I guess we uh, ruined uh, horror or something like that. I don't know what happened. But um, there weren't a lot of copies that were printed. Um, oh, Ra Rachel Deering, me, Cheshire Burke, and Amber Fallon. Those were the four of us. And um, I got two copies of the book, but um, you know there were no reviews. People people weren't able to really buy them as review copies, and so you know not a lot was said about it online. No one said they read the book, and you know how did they feel about this or that or the other thing. Um, and so I got the opportunity to have it reprinted by an Italian publisher. Uh, which was fantastic, and it was printed as a trade paperback, um, a standalone uh, book, and um, of course, absolutely no one has still reviewed it or talked about it, but um, it's given people an opportunity to actually read it now at an affordable price. Um, I was really pleased to be a part of the, the anthology and uh, to work with those women and with Brian, um, but I think those types of books where they're collectibles tend to work best with the really huge, huge writers like Peter Straub and Neil Gaiman, Stephen King. Right. Uh, and that's, a, a, you know, the name, name brand, it's going to draw, you know, the yeah. basically that type of customer. Uh, you know, and I, I like to think of myself as, you know, an, maybe like an amateur collector i've got some some stuff that's you know really hard to get but you know I, and i have friends that are that are collectors and they don't it's funny because they'll read the book they'll buy like the trashiest you know nastiest used copy just to read it but then they have you know one that you know they'll show me and you know that that they just spent like 1500 dollars on it and it's still shrink you know in the shrink wrap and everything oh and it's it's, like, yeah it's still yeah it's like no one can touch it and i'm like just <laughs> open it and let me look at the pages you know and they're like you know, no <laughs> yeah. you can't you can get it you know you can go ahead and get the kindle version if you want and it's like a dollar you know <laughs> so but yeah i know where you're coming from on there it's 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 crazy but it's working with brian king was probably like golly he's he is pretty damn cool <laughs> he is he is he's a great guy it's just a shame that you can't, as well as the collector's edition, get this collection as a Kindle, because then you know you've got the you've got the collector's element, but then you can share it with a wider audience. And I know, un unfortunately, yeah. perhaps due to my ignorance, I mean, this is the first I'm hearing of it, but I'm looking at it now on Good Goodreads, and <laughs> I want a copy. Yeah, well, the 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 standalone is is called the one that comes before, and you can get it on Amazon. Let's see, the one that comes before. Let me see. I think is it? Oh yes, it is. You you can get it as an ebook. Mm. It's two ninety nine on Amazon. You can get it for your Kindle, which means you can probably, if you're like anti Kindle, you can get it somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, I do. Well, I'm definitely not anti Kindle. <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I go back and forth. <laughs> but yeah, no, the paperback is thirteen ninety nine, and the Kindle version, the ebook version, is two ninety nine. It's the one that comes before. Mm. So, published by Independent Legions, which is an Italian press. Yeah. The Italians love me. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, I wonder, what advice would you give to your 18-year-old self? <laughs> oh, man. My 18-year-old self was so different. She was so different than I am now. I, I, I think the first thing I would tell her is to not stay in Tacoma as long as she did. I think that's, which seems odd since, you know, I talked about how I wanted to go back or wanted to go to a small town, but 
I think, I, I mean, when I graduated from college, I, I went back home and lived with my parents until I was 30 years old. I, I had no friends. I wasn't able to date. I, you know, uh, the years in my life when I should have been, you know, laying the foundation for the rest of my life and maybe getting married and thinking about having kids. I lived at home with my parents in, the, in my same bedroom that I grew up in because there were no jobs and I didn't have a car and I didn't know what to do with my life. I was still, I was still just kind of too afraid to go out there and do anything. And I would tell her to just scrape some money together and, you know, go to the shittiest out of state college she could find, you know, not to stay in Washington state and just to keep moving, you know, because Tacoma was always going to be there. Well, I mean, unless Mount Rainier erupts, but you know, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I would tell her to do that and not, not, not stay so close mm. to, to take more risks which is a really hard thing to tell someone who doesn't want to take risks right I mean it's yeah. all possible yeah no and then and then the 18 year old me would like be like what and then she'd go running into her bedroom and put her headphones on and like listen to some new wave music and <laughs> yeah so it wouldn't have been successful but that's what I would have told her <laughs> yeah well I mean with anyone, on other, on anyone, hand, sorry, go on. No, I was going to say, on the other hand, if I had taken that advice, I might not be a writer or I might be married with a couple of children and really fucking miserable. Right. Or divorced with a couple of children yeah. and really fucking miserable and, and not, not still, and still not able to do what I'm doing now. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm not married. I don't have kids. I live in an apartment building that's basically made out of ant spit and rats. Um, but I'm a pretty good writer. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that sounds super sad right now, but you know. <laughs> I think ant spit and rats sounds pretty good fuel for the horror writer's <laughs> yeah, imagination. <it's>, yeah. <laughs> It's great fuel for the next phase of my writing when I'm living in some beautiful little town somewhere in Wales or, you know, somewhere in the north. And I can start writing about New York and urban living the mm. way that I write about the Pacific Northwest. So, right. so yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all fuel for the fire mm. or the furnace, if you will. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what widely given or popular writing advice do you disagree with? Oh, um, I very vehemently disagree with write every day. You do not have to write every day. You can't, sometimes you cannot write every day. There's no need for you to write every day. You don't, you don't lose your place in the story. You don't forget how to write. You don't forget how to use a keyboard or pencil. Um, if you are someone who needs to take a couple days off, take them off. It does not mean you are not a writer. If you need to take a vacation or you need to take a year to recalibrate your life and get a better job or move somewhere or, you know, have kids or do whatever you need to do, then do it. You, that doesn't make you not a writer anymore. Um, I know that there are some art forms like in dance, you know, you, you, you have to move every day if you're a dancer, if, you, if you're, you know, working like at the American Ballet Company or whatever. Um, if you're in opera, you may feel you need to sing every day or do scales, scales what have you. Um, but people who are visual artists and, and even actors, actors do not act every day. I mean, you, you don't go to an empty stage and start acting. Um, you know, I, you can go weeks or months without having, you know, the opportunity to act. It doesn't make you an actor anymore. And I, and I just feel, I feel very strongly that you do not need to write every day. It's, it's stupid advice. Or I should say it's, if you feel that, that you're, you're someone who's being forced to write every day, then yeah, it's stupid advice for you. I mean, whatever advice works for people is, is fine. Everyone has different 
ways of, of doing things. Um, I guess think what I hate is is when people say do this or do that and intend for it to be a blanket rule for yeah. all writers. Yeah. And and that's now. Now I would much rather p have people say um, I write every day and it works for me. Your mileage may vary, but of course that's not as pithy as write every day. Yeah. So. <laughs> Well, I kind of feel with any writing advice that there is an invisible caveat that just says, look, take what works for you, discard what doesn't. Absolutely. If you tried to yeah. apply all the writing advice, you wouldn't write because if you applied all of it, it would end up contradicting each other. So. Yeah, yeah, it'll, yeah, it would just do nothing but cancel everything else out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on a similar line, what do you think are some misconceptions about horror in terms of what horror is, what horror isn't? It's very essence. Oh, I think pe people still, I, I, I would say in general, and not writers, but, but readers and people who know horror exist, they tend to take their... Uh, they, they tend to think of horror as what's being presented in movies and on TV and not necessarily what's being written. And uh, I think a lot of writers, or not writers, readers, and there are a lot of readers out there, um, and there are a lot who like horror, but to them, horror is still Stephen King or Anne Rice, and now Joe Hill too. Um, and they they have a, a kind of a I don't want to say narrow um, but it's a more set idea of what horror is um, and I know a lot of people get upset when horror is is often recategorized as thriller or literary fiction but actually a lot of horror is literary fiction um, the thing is is that I've, I've always said is that horror isn't is it people dying? It's not ghosts. It's an emotion. And you can have that emotion take place in virtually any kind of writing, in any kind of genre, um, in any kind of art form, visual or otherwise. Um, and that, that makes it hard to define because for some people, horror is the human centipede. And for other people, horror is being alone, you know. Um, and writers interpret horror differently. So I think that's why it's, a, it's much harder to categorize and much easier to, um, to miscategorize or to misclassify. Um, and it's easier to just say, oh, horror is just like women screaming and being raped by demons or whatever, or horror is something that I just don't like. Um, when there's really so many more, there's so many versions, uh, of horror. I'm starting to lose my words. <laughs> um, I, there's just, I mean, like I said, horror is an emotion and everyone has their own definition of it. So yeah, yeah. I just completely lost my train of thought, but yeah. <laughs> I, I think what you said when you said horror is an emotion that can happen in any genre, that just mm -hmm. rings so true. I think that really does capture the essence of horror and kind of mm -hmm. like what we're trying to do at this is horror to expand mm -hmm. that definition you know we're saying oh this this is horror as well <laughs> you know yeah um, yeah i i sometimes find myself if i'm talking to people about what it is i do and about the website the podcast the publishing that when i explain it's a horror publication I then almost want to go off on a little spiel about what horror is. And that it's like now horror might be wider than you think it is. It's not just zombies and monsters. Yeah. And women screaming and being raped, as you put it, which isn't, isn't a line that I've used to open a, a conversation. Yeah, no. And, and honestly, I mean, my, my, first, my first experiences with horror in writing 
were not that kind of, you know, it wasn't that trope, but you know, by the time it got around to the eighties, it was all yeah. those horrifying paperbacks. And, and so it, it did, it did kind of, I mean, that does kind of influence you. Um, and it did for a while me, but, but not anymore. Um, and a lot of it is the reason why is because I've, I've read so wide widely in, in so many, you know, in fiction, nonfiction, poetry, you know, plays, dramatic literature, um, and lots of translations. And, and so I, I was just lucky that I had, that I, I love to read and that my parents encouraged my reading and that, you know, I was, I was able to spend a massive chunk of my early life doing nothing but reading mm. everything I could get my hands on. So I found horror in many different places. It's interesting to see how different subgenres and flavors of horror become popular in different times. I mean, as as you said, in the eighties there was a lot of pulp, there was a lot of splatter mm -hmm. punk, real visceral in your face horror. I think at the moment, certainly within independent publishing, there's what I think Scott Nicolay coined a weird renaissance or someone coined it if, if you're listening and you're not Scott Nicolay then uh. I apologize <laughs> but yeah well, I, know, I know that I know that Jeff and Ann Vandermeer really um uh have done a lot um yes to, yes you know with their anthologies and um and their their editing have, have done a lot to really push the term weird Kind of like into the mainstream yeah um and and the, i've i started out saying i was a horror writer um but more and more people call me a, a weird fiction writer and that may be a better description than horror um because i everything i do is is such a mash of of stuff well this is why just referring to it as dark fiction is so great because it basically captures all of these yes. things that we're talking about. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I usually say I write dark, dark fiction mm. and that's it, yeah. Although I do like saying I write horror because a lot of people so, they, you know, they hate saying horror uh, for yeah. whatever reason. And, and I kind of feel like, mm, no, I write horror. I really do write horror. Um, and that's not to drag anyone. Um, you know, who feels that they're being misclassified. Um, but uh, yeah, what I do write a lot of dark fiction, but I do write a lot of actual horror. Right. Yeah, and I, I guess like if, if we feel as if when people hear horror, they have misconceptions, it can be mm -hmm. important to say, look, what I'm doing is horror and to reclaim that label. Yeah, I guess that's kind of what I'm hoping I'm doing, but I think... I think I, a number of people need to do that with me in order to... Oh, yeah, that. yeah. One one person isn't going to start the, the horror yeah. revolution. So if you're, yeah. if you're listening... She's taking it back. Stand up and join <laughs> us. Yeah. One person at a time. Yeah. One person every decade at a time. Right, right. <laughs> it's the new revolution. We're taking horror back. <laughs> <laughs> okay so to finish off and this is always the hardest part if i'm going to ask a final question got to make it count uh -oh. okay th th this is a big question uh oh what is most important to you in life so just let's end with a casual meaning of life question um all right, this is going to be like a stupid answer, and I don't know how to answer it any other way. But if if the most important thing in my life, if I could have it, is a dog. To me, dogs are the most important thing in life. If I because if I had a dog, it means I would have a life that allowed a dog. I would have a nice place to live. I would have a huge backyard. There would be woods where I could wander. Um, and I would have enough money to be able to 
to give the dog the lifestyle that it wanted. Um, and, um, and so for me, it's like a dog is like the ultimate, that would, for me would be the ultimate happiness. Does that, is that stupid? No, it's not. It's no, not it's stupid. not. It's what, not stupid at all. What, what, what I think is kind of funny is like, I really want a dog too, but the, <laughs> like the place I'm renting will not allow it. And what's so frustrating is even though it's a no pets apartment, it is clearly mm -hmm. big enough for a dog. There's clearly a lot yeah. of places to walk it around here, but it's, and <laughs> get, get, get you it. know how some women I'm sorry <laughs> go ahead I was just going to say like in in Japan I found getting getting an apartment renting an apartment that will al allow a pet <laughs> it's difficult it's really oh, difficult but you know what's even more difficult is probably getting a mortgage so like un <laughs> until one of those two things happens no dog yeah. for me <laughs> Yeah, see, that's just it. It's like I, the I would never. People ask me, oh, you know, if you have mice in your apartment, get a cat or you know a rat terrier or whatever. And I'm like, I would never, never in a million years have an animal live in such a horrible apartment. You know, um, the air conditioning wouldn't be enough to keep them cool, and there's no place for them to sit by the windows. They'd be cooped up all day. And for me, having a dog means that I would be staying at home all the time. So I must have a successful writing career and a nice place to live if I have a dog. So if I have a dog, it means everything else in my life is just, you know, is just firing on all four pistons. So, yeah. And plus dogs are awesome. Yeah. I love dogs. Yes. Yeah, they are. I, mean, I love cats, but I'm really, I feel like I'm a cat person myself. Like I have the, I, I'm like introspective and, and, and a dog kind of brings me out of my shell. A dog is like yeah. the other half of me. Yeah. They're happy and they love you so much. And, and so, yeah. Yep. So if you're listening to this and you don't have a dog and you have the means to get a dog, <laughs> stop listening to yeah. the podcast and get a dog and then tweet yeah. us at this is horror with your dog pictures. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, and then go on Twitter and please send me your dog pictures. Yeah. <laughs> so that I can remember what it is I'm writing for. I'm not writing for glory or for awards. I'm writing for a dog. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can just print wow. out a load of dog pictures and you can put them in front of like your writing desk. And it's like, this is what it's Actually, about. I have a small cork bulletin board in front of in, in, in front of my desk and I do have some dog pictures on it. <laughs> That's awesome. There you go. There you go. Visualization. Yeah, so. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us this evening. It's been oh, a great thank, conversation. Thank yeah, yes. I've I've enjoyed it a lot. Thank you so much for having me. Where can our listeners connect with you? Um, I'm mainly on Twitter right now. Um, my uh, website is woefully out of um, out of date, but um, at the end of the month, or I should say after Memorial Day, I will be handing my novel into my agent, and then I will be doing a little bit of house cleaning online, and I'll go back to being on Twitter more often and um, and updating my website again. And I'm also on Instagram, um, but my pictures aren't like Instagram pretty. They're, you know, so if you like looking at like pictures of books and weird things, like in super <laughs> oversaturated colors, like a four year old took the pictures. <laughs> yeah, Instagram is, is where to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, do you have any final thoughts or words of wisdom that you'd like to leave our listeners with? No, I, I really don't. I, you know, um, I guess for writers, just, you know, write what you want and fuck what people tell you to write. And, and readers just like keep reading and search out new stuff all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And send me dog pictures. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that's a, a good note to end on. 
Yeah, watch. I'm going to get like some really weird dog pictures. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's not a dog in your lap. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's the note to end on. <laughs> there it is. It's right there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the This Is Horror podcast with Livia Llewellyn. Join us again next week where we will be back with another great interview. And remember, if you want access to the syllabus that Livia was talking about putting together, then support us on Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash This Is Horror. And as soon as we have that syllabus, you will get access to it. You get a load of other perks too, like the ability to submit a question to our guest and also early bird access to every episode. Before I wrap up, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. The 11 stories in Todd Keisting's Ugly Little Things explore the depths of human suffering and ugliness, charting a course to the dark, horrific heart of the human condition. John Langan says, Todd Kysing is a born storyteller, drawing the reader into artfully constructive narratives that scout the darker end of the literary spectrum with skill and bravado. Brian Kirk says, in Ugly Little Things, Todd Kysing ventures deep into the dark abyss of cosmic horror. What he finds there, or what's found him, will terrify you. This is going to hurt and you're going to like it. That's Todd Kysing's Ugly Little Things, out September 15th from Crystal Lake Publishing, Tales from the Darkest Depths. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news. Now you can have a St- Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day. To finish off, a quote from Amy Hempel. A story happens when two equally appealing forces or characters or ideas try to occupy the same place at the same time. And they're both right. I'll see you in the next episode. Until then, look after yourself, be good to one another, read horror and have a great, great day. Well, let us know if you start flagging and then we can wrap up. Okay. Um, or, or as you say, just the thumb will be indicator yeah. enough. Like, okay, <laughs> let's hang up the cool bob. <laughs> She's passed out. <laughs> or dead, Send help. <laughs> we'll find out tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>